Okay. I think we can uh, come back. Uh, Dennis, are you recording? Sim, tá gravando já. Ah, tá bom. Okay. So, I will continue then. Uh, Alessandra, there is a Wait. question from Davi. He put it on the chat. Yeah. Uh, can, can you read the chat or do you want me to read? Yeah, them? I can, I can, I can read them. Um, as I have asked myself, what about fixing hydrophones oh, for policy since it could mitigate or eliminate issues with your special value? I have read a bit about the autonomous ones. It's totally possible for reasons such as cost and maintenance, but there is uh, Under certain day. Ah, okay, David. See, uh, sorry. <laughs> yes, it is uh, totally possible to fix uh, hydrophones on the ground. You know? uh, actually, I'm going to talk about it, I think, yes, in the next three slides. Uh, this is what people call as permanent reservoir monitoring. So, They fix the, the receivers uh, at the, the ground. So the receivers, they cover. Uh, so if you think about the seismic survey, of course, now we are talking into more like a, a dedicated seismic survey, right? So because now we know where is the reservoir and we want to target the reservoir, okay? It's not an exploration size where we need to, to see a, a basin or something much more big, right? So that's something more localized. So that's what they do for monitoring. So some of, of the fields, they have permanent reservoir monitoring, and that's exactly the case you were, you were mentioning. So they put the receivers into the ground, they, and they leave it there, and they never remove it. Well, they, they remove it when, when they abandon the field, but, but the idea is to leave the receivers there, and then at some, uh, at some times, uh, there is a bolt that comes shooting. So the price for it, of course, you have to invest some money initially to, to put this, this system on the ground. And then, but then uh, after you have the, the system installed, you just need to pay for the, the shooting. So, so you, the boots comes uh, at, at some time to shoot the, the service and then, but the receivers are there acquiring, uh, acquiring uh, the signals, right? So this is something that it, it already uh, happens uh, in, There are some examples around the world. In Brazil, we have some permanent reservoir monitoring. By the way, uh, the data we are working uh, in our uh, for the project in UNICE, it uses a uh, data from from PRN. Uh, and this I uh, have to mention another thing, which is the fact of the day. As you mentioned, this idea of keeping the the, the receptors at the same position is exactly, that's the solution for 4D. Exactly, that's the solution. Because then you can guarantee that you are acquiring information, uh, you, you are, that's what actually, uh, I'm going back to my slides, so that's exactly what it has to do with uh, uh, repeatability. So you can guarantee that you are, the seismic signals that you are acquiring are related to that position of the, of the, the ground, okay? So yes, very, very good point, and that's a, a, a good practice. Uh, I don't know if you want to complement with something or you can go back. Yeah, okay, great. Right, so, um, yeah. So the success of this uh, idea of for this size of project uh, depends on these two things, the detectability and repeat repeatability. I'm going to talk about repeatability first because that's what Dave just mentioned. So I think it's nice to, to just to care a little bit more on that. So the repeatability is exactly the things uh, he, he, he had just mentioned. So we need to ensure the most as we can that we are going to acquire the data uh, that we are able actually to, re to repeat the same acquisition with the same uh, uh, with the same um, Uh, draw for the seismic service, you know. Uh, and then the second thing is the detectability. So detectability, it means the magnitude of the change in the seismic signal to, due to production. So this, it has to be 
uh, it has to do with a lot of things. So the rock, the, the rock properties, uh, some of the rocks, uh, they, they generate uh, stronger for the signals than other rocks. Uh, it also depends a lot on the production uh, strategy that is being used, that is being applied in the field. So if you have uh, water injection, water flow, this is a very nice example where for this size data responds quite well. Uh, people now are trying to track the, the walk cycles as well. It's a little bit more challenging for the signals, but, but it's something that people are trying. Uh, so, so that's, uh, so the tech tablet has to do with all of these things. So it's, it's very specific for each reservoir. Okay. So, so it depends on the reservoir, the rock types, the fluid content, the type of oil, uh, and also how is the, the dynamic of the field along production. So the, the pressure change, the fluid change and so on. So going back to repeatability, ah, no, sorry. Uh, so this, there is this, uh, this graph here where I show. So in the Y axis, we have detectability and the X axis, the repeatability. So of course, uh, the more we have from two, the higher the chance of success. So the most, uh, uh, the more repeatability I, I can have, which would be this uh, PRM system that I've just mentioned, the, the permanent reservoir monitoring. This is the best case. And if you have a very nice uh, reservoir, like a very nice sandstones with, uh, uh, with uh, water floating, for instance, which is a very good scenario for 4D, then we have very high chances of success. So the lower we have in terms of repeatability and detectability, of course, the lower are the chances of success. So as I mentioned, the repeatability depends on the acquisition geometry. You need to repeat this the most as you can. The more you can, the, the, the geometry and the processing uh, similarity. Of course, I, I was talking about the acquisition, but there is a, a very important role here uh, that uh, that is performed by the process team. So there, there are some, the, the processing uh, of 4D seismic data is, uh, there are some specific uh, processing for, for this seismic data, which aims to, uh, to help on this issue of repeatability. And then the detectability, as I mentioned already, so depends on the rock and fluid properties and the depletion process. So depends if the change, how the change happened, if it was a lot of change, few chains, and how these change, uh, they interfere so that they can generate a nice for the scene. Talking about the repeatability, so uh, as I said, there are some options for the 4D size for the seismic survey. So uh, there are some 4D seismic data with the, the conventional service, which is this the, the streamers I mentioned in the beginning. So this is this is common because the, the streamer is the most common way of acquiring a survey, a, a seismic survey, and there are some uh, 4D seismic acquisition being done like this so this is not the best the very best scenario but uh, but there are some uh success cases of applying this type of technology even that one that i showed uh, from brazil well even the ones from norn like gulfux norn uh for norway sorry so gulfux norn marlene they were all acquired with this type of of, of uh technology right so this stream as i mentioned it's not the very best case uh, there are a lot of noise and some problems but still it's possible and we can extract very uh, valuable information from for this size of data. Uh, there is also these, uh, this type of acquisition, which is the OBC, the ocean water cable, and the OBN. Uh, but these are not permanent. So, but then you can put the these guys. They are on the ground, right? So these are the cables, and these are the nodes. So, so uh, you can put the system on the ground, and then, uh, of course, you can have a better control of where the receivers, the location of the, in terms of X and Y, right? Uh, you can you can have a, a much a better control where the receivers are and ensure a better uh, repeatability. And this, oh, sorry, it's important. So this is a permanent system, right? So, or PRM, uh, Permanent Reservoir Monitor. So this is the very best solution for, for this size of data because then they stall the, the systems, the, the receivers in the ground. And as I said, they stay there during uh, reservoir production. Uh, so this type of system, uh, that's what they are planning to do for, for the Libre field, one of the giant fields in Presal. Uh, for Lula, I'm not very sure, but I think for Lula they, they use uh, nodes. But I'm sorry, I don't know this information. I cannot say. But for 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 the Libre field, for sure, that's what they're playing. 
Okay, and then when we have this type of signal uh, or this type of systems, the quality of the, the signal, the size of the signal is really, really high. It's much better. You have much less noise and, and the, the quality of, of the, the size of the data in general is much higher. It's much better. It's, it's much more clear. The signal is much clearer. Um, we need to remember uh, there are some issues, you know, when we are planning our... Because uh, the seismic data traditionally uh, is used for exploration, right? So you're using, you do, you are acquiring a seismic survey in a very a big area to explore, to find the reservoir, and so on. But in the moment of exploration, uh, usually, uh, of course, my happen that you have uh, some platforms from other fields. But usually, in the exploration, of course, the, the, you don't, you don't, you haven't done discovery yet. So there, there are no platforms. There are no production facilities there. But then, when we move to 4D seismic data, we are in a different scenario. The reservoir is already there, and usually, and of course, it is already producing, right? So you have the production facilities there installed. So this is a really a big issue. If you need to, to drive a boat, and with these huge cables, you know, and, and you, you need to, of course, you, you should not destroy the facilities, or, or you need to guarantee the, the, the production facilities will be there and safe there, you know. So this is an issue for, for the seismic data, for acquiring data. So this type of solution, like the nodes, uh, which they use some, um, I forgot the name, but some like a, like a small robot to to locate the nodes in, into the seabed. So this is a solution for when you have uh, the, all the production facilities installed in the field, right? Uh, and then the, when you plan a, a, a PRM, right? Then uh, usually you, you plan it uh, before you start producing the field, so then you can schedule, uh, you know, the installation of everything, the installation of the system, the, the monitor system, and of course the, the production system. Um, okay. So uh, now uh, talking about detectability. So detectability, as I said, depends on the reservoir uh, and the production strategy that is being applied, right? So we know that during production, when the reservoir starts to produce, uh, the change that happens in the reservoir are basically these ones, right? So we have fluid saturation change, we have pressure change, we might have porous change if we have compaction, for instance, and temperature uh, change for some case, right? <clears throat> and this, as I mentioned already, this causes change in the speed of wave propagation and the density of the rocks. So it changes this pro the rock properties, right? So uh, if we look here, oh, sorry, let me the this. Okay. So if we look here in this uh, illustration, we have the reservoir here. So it's a simple scheme, right? So that's the reservoir. Uh, in the original uh, condition, so before any production, let's say. So we have the, so this is an illustration of the seismic signals first uh, on, on the top of the reservoir, that's the sign. So this is the, actually that's the reflection of the seabed, assume that is offshore, right? So this will be the water layer. Uh, then we have uh, uh, here another uh, reflection of the bottom, uh, of the bottom of the sorry, this is not the, the this is a sediment because this is the top reservoir. So that's the top, that's the base, and that's another uh, formation that is below the reservoir. So these are the uh, 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 scheme showing the the, the signals. So uh, we assume usually it's, it's very common to assume that nothing changes in the rocks in the under burden, so below, uh, above the reservoir, and below the reservoir. So the under, the, let's assume this uh, more uh, simple situation, right? Where uh, the over burden uh, does not change, okay? So the only thing that really changed is the reservoir. So let's say, for instance, these uh, rocks were filled uh, with oil, and now they're filled with water, because you injected water, right? So as I mentioned before, uh, there will be some change. For this, um, for the reflection that comes, that pass any any size uh, uh, wave that pass that cross the reservoir and reaches the, the receptor will have a different a different sign, right? So this is that's the gray uh, signal here. So so this one on the base of the reservoir and that one uh, that's reflecting a, a surface that it's below the reservoir, it's also going to change uh, the, the signals. Okay, uh, note that the, this signal is not going to change. So everything above the reservoir should be identical. Okay, if we assume that the overburden, if you don't have any geomechanical effects, like the overburden is not 
having uh, it doesn't change drastically. Uh, the overburden, I mean, everything that it's above the reservoir is actually used for, for the process to measure the repeatability of the signals. You know, if because above the reservoir, nothing changes. So if nothing changes, uh, when you subtract them, ideally, this subtraction should give me zero signal. It should be an empty signal, right, above the reservoir. So that's how actually they do the quality control of the, the size across the 4D size process. But then in the inside the reservoir and below it, things will change because the, the, the wave is going to travel to a different rock. I mean, a rock with diff, under different conditions, under a different pressure uh, uh, values and, and, and with a different saturation, different fluid content. Okay. All right. So, uh, but then what's, what's behind that? So why the velocity, uh, the, the sound velocity in the VP is changing because of these things? So uh, the, the velocity of the, the, the sound velocity, the, the last wave velocity, VP is written with this equation. So we have uh, K here and me and, and Rho. So K and K is the book models, right? Uh, and me, is the shear models. So these two models, they measure the stiffness of the rock. And rho is the density. So density is the density as you, you know the definition, okay? So, but these two models, they define how stiff is the rock. So how easy it is to compress, or oh, oh, sorry, uh, how difficult is to compress uh, the rock. Okay, so this move, this the, the K, the book models, uh, it gives us uh, uh, the uh, uh, measurement of how hard it is to compress the rock. So uh, it's uh, how hard is, is it is to change the volume of the rocks. So if you remember in the very beginning of the class, I mentioned that the P wave velocity, uh, it's uh, it's a rock, it's it's traveling, it's shaking the particles. Uh, of the rock, so that's that's how uh, so that's um, how the, the propagation is happening. Okay, so it, this movement of the particle is related to the compressibility of the rock. So you're kind of compressing the rocks uh, as long as the the, the, the the wave is propagating. And the shear models uh, is is this uh, this is the stiffening of the rocks in terms of the sh of changing uh, of the the shape of the rock. Okay, so. Uh, the velocity of the rocks, it's, it's going to be higher or lower, it depends on how much you can compress or you can shear these rocks, okay? So you can, so that's how we explain uh, the detectability of the rocks. So if you have a carbonate, for instance, they, they are very stiff rocks. So they, are very, they have a very high bulk module, so they, they are hard to compress, okay? So these guys, they have a high velocity model. If you have a sandstone, for instance, they are more soft rocks, easy to compress. So they give us a lower velocity models, lower velocity values. Okay. All right. So this is stiffness of the rocks uh, depends on the, the rock matrix. As I said, if it's a carbonate, if it's a sandstone, depends on the mineral properties. Depends on the rock frame, you know, depends on the pore system, how the pore system uh, is distributed on the rock. Yeah, sorry. I, I wanted to um, clarify something. I wanted to clarify something on the, um, the part of the bulk modulus of um, sandstones, limestones, and shale. So you said the limestones have um, higher bulk modulus. So um, between limestones and shales, which have um, higher bulk modulus? Uh, limestones and shales, you mean? You mentioned. Oh, sorry. Uh, well, okay. I don't know. I'm really bad to memorize numbers. I don't know by hand. But so I'll give you a guess. Okay, my feeling. I think I think it is limestones. But I can I can check in the literature and give you the very correct answer. Okay. But I th I would say that it's it is limestones. I think they are more stiffer. But I need to double check. Is that okay? Uh, that that would give us an issue with uh, our density load and so forth. I mean, if uh, if if limestones have higher compressibility, it means you're going to have higher 
density in the, in the limestones and the um, higher chemical of uh, So I'm, I'm finding it difficult to be able to differentiate on our sunny club if this is the case, you know, between limestones and shape. Sorry, I, I didn't do it cut a little bit. I didn't understand. So yeah, you're saying that it's it's what you're mentioning is the difficult of differentiate between limestone and shapes because they would have the same uh, elastic properties. I mean, the same uh, density or similar density and similar uh, bulk models. That's what you're mentioning. Yes, that's what I, I mean. Yeah, well, these things, yes, these things uh, can happen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I agree. This is this well, this is a, a big problem for reservoir characterization, right? If we're talking about uh, petrophysics, if you look at the well logs and try to differentiate between things, it's very hard, right? So, so to to have this this type of information, uh, we ask, actually we access this type of information by look at core, like plugs, you know, the core data and the well log data to see if you can identify who is who. Uh, but yes, it is a big issue. Yeah, they, they might have similar values and it becomes very difficult to differentiate between them. Yeah. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. All right. So, come back to the slides. Uh, yes, so the stiffness of the rock, yes. Uh, yes, it depends on, on all of these things. So the rock matrix, the rock frame, I mean, how the pore system is defined, and, now, and also the pore volumes. Okay, so uh, if you have, let's say, if you have a sandstone, right, like a, almost uh, pure quartz or whatever, uh, just a sandstone. If, if the sandstone, if the pore volume is filled with uh, oil, uh, then it's going to have a final uh, stiffness or uh, book modulus of something, of some degree. Okay, but then if we, if we uh, let's say if, we're, if we have a core data and then we're doing an exercise of, we fill the, this core, this plug with oil and then we measure the stiffening of the rock. Then if we fill again, if we clean up the, the core and fill again with water and measure again the stiffness, it's going to change. Even if exactly the if same exact, if you have the same structure, if you have exactly, it's going to have exactly the same rock matrix and the same, assume the core doesn't change, right? So we have the same core volume. Uh, the, the stiffness of the rock is going to change because the, the stiffness, uh, the compressibility of the fluids are different, right? So the oil is more compressible than water, for instance. So this is also going to change the, the whole, the total uh, stiffness of the rock. And the seismic waves, they respond to that, right? So if it is a, a more stiff rock, the, the velocity tends to be higher. The, the velocity usually are higher. So if it's a less stiff rock, the velocity are lower. So that's, that's how the 4D seismic, that's the physics behind the 4D seismic data. Okay. So I'll talk about the, the four fluids, but, but the pressure is the same. You know, the pressure uh, might change the compressibility of the rocks, I mean, the pore pressure. Okay, so it will also change the way the velocity and the way the, the density, uh, the, the rock density, the values of the rock density uh, is. Okay, so when we have pressure changes in the reservoir due to production, the pressure variations uh, can cause. Uh, the, one of the things is that is going to change the, the, the bulk modulus of the fluid. Because as I said, the, the, if you change the fluid, I mean, each fluid has a different compressibility, right? And of course, the density of the fluid is going to change as well if you change the pressure. They are sensitive to pressure, right? The fluid uh, uh, properties. Also, uh, we might increase uh, the gas saturation, increase or decrease, or decrease the gas saturation. Right? If you are de in a depletion, if you, the, the pressure, the reservoir pressure is going down, the pore pressure is going down, then the, there is. Well, it might happen that the gas comes out of solution, then you increase the, the gas saturation. Or the opposite, if you're injecting a lot and then you're pressurizing the reservoir, it might happen that the gas uh, uh, come back to, to, to the oil phase and then you decrease the gas saturation, right? Another thing that might happen when you have pressure variation is changes um, in porosity and 
uh, and the, the books model uh, by itself. You, know? you, you can change uh, uh, the porosity uh, depends on the, on the pressure. Now you can, for instance, uh, the, the reservoir can suffer like compactions and then you change the, the, the pore system. And of course, this will interfere uh, K and mu, right? Uh, so this is an example of, uh, well, this was extracted from, from a course uh, from this professor from Stanford. So these are measurements made with core data in the lab, right? So there is here, so that's the velocity, and this is pressure, uh, effective pressure, which is uh, well, the equation of effective pressure, it's, it's uh, the opposite of pore pressure. So it's the confining pressure, so the overburden pressure, minus the pore pressure in a simplified view, okay? So the, I'm just, I just brought this image to show the difference of, of the behavior of, of the, the velocity field. So first of all, let's look at these two curves here. So this one, so that's a limestone, right? So this is a dry rock. So it means that in the lab, they remove the fluid inside the rock. So that's a dry rock, okay? So this is how the P velocity is behaving um, according to the increase of effective pressure, which is the decrease of pore pressure, okay? So the velocity is, is, is increasing quite a lot for this rock, you see, it goes from, two, from three kilometers per second to five uh, because of the pressure change. Uh, so, and these things are happening because uh, there are some cracks that are being closed and, and so on, and you're changing the structure of the rocks. So, if these, uh, if when this rock, they do the same experiment now with the rock saturated with water, right? So these are these black points here. So the first thing that I would like to mention is that if you take under the same pressure uh, uh, regime here, if you have the same pressure, so just the difference between having oil and water in the rock, you see there is a difference in velocity. So it goes, let's say, for instance, for 100 bars, uh, it goes from four to almost five. Uh, so you have almost one kilometer per second of difference. So there is this, uh, so this rock is very sensitive to this change, right? Uh, while when this uh, rock is water saturated, so now the rock is more uh, uh, is more stiff because uh, the, the the pore uh, system is filled with water. So we see that this uh, curve is a little bit more flat, right? So it's not that sensitive to pressure anymore. So so this and this is just one example for for this particular rock that they use in this lab measurement. So uh, this is just to point that uh, this things relate to the sensitivity uh, of the, the signals, the, the velocity or so on. It's very, uh, there is a complex physics behind it and there are several possibilities of, of dynamic change that will cause a change in velocity, a change in density that in the future would call the change in the, for, in the seismic signals. Uh, here I'm showing the, the difference in terms of fluid density. So this is uh, actually, these are log data. So uh, yes, log data. So that's P impedance, right? Uh, and this is porous. So for this log data, uh, we are showing here that we have uh, the, the rock is set, the reservoir here is saturated with gas and here with water. So again, we can see the difference so in value. So in average here, the water is around 7,000 7, and for gas, uh, well, it's below 6,000. Okay, so we can differentiate the, these things. So taking up for the uh, data, uh, we can see the difference by uh, the difference uh, that, that happened with pollution. Let's say if, if somewhere in the reservoir there was water and now it has gas, we are going to see this decrease in PMP. Okay. Um, so um, one thing that I don't see if I have something else here. So the fluid, the, yes, the fluid uh, book models and then some are affected by the change in composition pressure and temperature during production, of course. So, so the fluid properties, uh, they change uh, uh, during production uh, because of, especially because of pressure and sometimes uh, temperature variation. And this will cause as well a change in the, in the, the compressibility of the, of, the, of the fluids and the density of the fluids, which will affect the stiffness of the rocks, okay? Uh, all right, so here, I think this is, yes, that's the last slide. I just, I, I put kind of some uh, rules of thumb that we use, because uh, I'm going to show later on uh, an example of 4D seismic interpretation. 
because we need to understand this type of th physics to explain the for this size seismic signals later on, as we are going to see. Because when we see, let's say, a map for this size map or something like this, we need to explain those signals. And sometimes they're very obvious, but sometimes they're not. So sometimes it's very hard to explain the signals. And we need to, to look at things like this, you know? So we need to, to look at, the, uh, at this uh, physical model, rock physics models that give us this sensitivity of, of density and velocity to uh, fluid and pressure change, okay? So, uh, yeah, well, this is uh, another example that I extract from, from the same material. Uh, we have, let's look at the, okay, so that's the book model. So this is the stiffness uh, the, that shows the stiffness of the rock. So this is a sandstone. Uh, so for this sandstone, if this against effective pressure again. So uh, here we can clearly see the effect of fluid and pressure as well. So first of all, let, let's look at the fluid. So if the, the plug, the rock, is, 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 is dry, I mean, there is no fluids inside the, the core volumes, so that's how it behaves with pressure. But then when you have oil, uh, the, the plug saturated with oil, then we have this uh, increase in the book model, so the rock is a little bit more stiff. And then if we replace this water, this oil, by water, then the rock is even stiffer, okay? And then the book modulus is higher, right? Um, so for, for all of these cases, for these sandstones, we can see uh, there is a, well, a nice uh, change with pressure as well. So for all the cases, uh, well, if you note, it's different from the, that limestone. If you remember the limestone, the water change, uh, the, the rock saturated with water almost did not change with, with pressure. But in this case, there is, even when the, the rock saturated with water, there is the, ch the, the pressure change is causing some... Uh, some difference in the book modules, right? Okay, so the book module is increasing with effective pressure. Uh, okay, so there are some uh, kind of uh, rule of thumbs, let's say some general behaviors that we usually observe because as you can see, this is, of course is, is very dependent on the rock, on the reservoir. So, so we need a very uh, detailed study to really understand it in, in, in a particular field. You know? So it is a quite strong integration with petrophysics and, and anything related to rock fist, right? But there is the, those rule of thumbs just for us to, to locate a little bit. So usually the velocity and the density, they increase when the water replaces oil or gas, because water is more compressible. Uh, so VP and uh, velocity and density decrease when gas replacing oil or water. And for fluid change, the Vs, the shear velocity, remain constant. So the, the, the shear velocities, they do not propagate on fluids. So they are not sensitive to, to fluids. The shear velocities are much more, they are sensitive to pressure change, but not really to fluids. Um, and pressure change, so Vp and Vs, they increase in response to decrease for pressure and or compaction and the velocity decreased during injection as a result of increased pressure. Okay, so uh, now I'm going to do a very uh, quick exercise with you. So let's look at the P velocity, VP. Okay, so I just said that the, the VP, uh, it's decreased during injection because of the pressure. So when you inject water, for instance, if you, if you look at around the injector well, Okay, so you are injecting water. So the pore pressure is increased, right? So we are pressurizing the reservoir. So this causes a decrease in the p-velocity, right? So the p-velocity is going to decrease because of that. But at the very same moment, uh, the rock is being filled by water, right? Because you're injecting water. So there is a fluid change. So the water is replacing oil, for instance. Let's assume that we are injecting in an oil zone, okay? So the water is replacing the oil. So the VP would increase with that. So it will decrease because of pressure, uh, because of the increase of flow pressure, but the same velocity should increase because of the fluid change, because the water is replacing oil. So what I want to say with this, I'm going to, I want you to highlight here that there are some competing effects so there are some things that happen at the same time, but that they kind of mess up the Ford signals because you have some 
a, a production effect that is increasing uh, property, but the other one that is decreasing this property. So it might be the case that this competition will totally cancel the difference. So we were, we're not going to see we are not going to see anything before the signals because the the this competing effects they might cancel each other. So this is an issue with for this seismic data, and that's something we need to keep in mind. It might happen. It might happen that sometimes uh, the uh, around the injector the pressure signals winds, and then we see a very strong uh, decrease in velocity, for instance, because the the, the pressures the, the signal relates to the increase of power pressure once. The, 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 the effects of the fluid saturation change. And in the other case, it might happen the opposite. We might see uh, the, just the water uh, flowed in the reservoir because the, 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 the fluid saturation change won from the pressure, so the pressure change. Or it might be the case that we don't see anything. Okay? So this is just to, to, to start to, to mention uh, some challenges of for this seismic data. Uh, okay, so there, are, as I said, you know, all of these things that are, well, this this will be a, a, a complete course by itself. You know, rock physics is a very complex uh, uh, topic and, and very important topic. So I just give you some very general idea for you to, to see it. But then, well, there are some uh, uh, very complete studies that we do behind the scenes to understand it very uh, deep for each case, okay? Um, one of the things that we do with the rock physics uh, is the what we call feasibility studies. So what we are doing here, so we are first understand how these things happen in the field, how are this connection between the, the rock matrix, the pore fluids, and, uh, and how they, they change during production. And then we try to model the 4D seismic data, how these signals would be. Okay, so usually we use a simulation model to give us the pressure change and the saturation change, uh, and also we use for us the porosity field. We use the rock physics models that are developed using log data and core data, <clears throat> and we model the scenarios of the, the, the P velocity and the shear velocity and density for those different situations. And then we generate this, this thing here that it's a synthetic seismic data. And then we can generate the size of service, like for the syntax for the size of service. So we have here a base size server and a monitor, then we can subtract, and then we can see what we would expect for our reservoir. So how is going to be this competing effect? I'm, I am going, I'm going to be able to see anything. I am going to be able to see a water flowing signal. Uh, am I going to be able to see a, a pressure um, increase, for instance, or whatever? Okay, so this type of exercise, uh, it's very common, especially if you're planning uh, to, if you're still planning to perform a 4D size study. So here we have uh, some clues to see if the 4D size data is going to bring nice information or not, okay? All right, uh, so when we think about the 4D, we also have this workflow, which is pretty much similar to 3D seismic data. So we have the acquisition of the monitors, we need to process the data, we need to interpret the data, and finally integrate it with uh, the reservoir models, right? But a little bit different from the 3D seismic data, for the 4D seismic data, we have a huge challenge, which is the time versus the value of information. Because uh, the fraud seismic data, it's really, as you, we are seeing, it's really related to, uh, to the management of the field, to understanding how the, the, the production is happening and try to improve decisions, right? So if it takes too long to process, uh, to acquire, to process and interpret this data, it might happen that this data becomes useless. Right. So if I'm, let's say I have a infill uh, drilling campaign happening in my company. So I want to drill one or two new infill, infill wells. If the 4D seismic data arrives too late, I have already, uh, it might, it might happen that I drill a red, uh, uh, a dry well. You know? uh, so it was too late. So the 4D seismic data arrived after I drilled the well. So it makes no sense, right? So uh, there is this issue, this is really challenging for, for, for everyone who work with 4D seismic data. We need to, to have the information 
uh, as soon as possible so that we can change uh, decisions, right? We can help with the decision uh, process the, to operate the field. Uh, so, of course, the fast track procedures, they are very welcome in all stages. Uh, there are some, the big companies like, like Shell, Equinor, uh, Petrobras also work on that. They have some fast track procedures to to fast, to speed up the, the especially the processing that takes more time, processing and interpretation. Okay, and then uh, so they can decrease the, the time of processing from one year to months, something like this. Okay, so that's something that is already happening. Okay, so now I'm going to talk a, a little bit about interpretation that is related to that thing related to the rock fees that I just mentioned. So this is an image of, of one of our cases. Um, uh, one of the, the data that we are using in the field, in, in Unisync, sorry. So this is a map uh, of the monitor. We have two monitors for this case. So that's monitor one minus base, and this is monitor two minus the base case. Okay, so that's the map view of the reservoir. So that's a map of the difference. Okay, so that's the 4D signals of this specific reservoir. So uh, every, these things in blue here, uh, you can see there is I6, I5, I6, I1, and I2. So these are injector wells. So they are horizontal wells, and they are injecting water, just water. And the red ones are the producers. Okay. So <clears throat> there. So there is. So this is a producer. This is a producer. <clears throat> there are some. As I said, we need to. Okay. We look at this type of formation. The geophysicists look at this data, and now he needs. He or she needs to interpret this data. We need to explain what are these signals. So there are some of them are very easy. So as I said, these guys are are, are the water injector wells, right? horizontal wells, right? So these blue signals, are red, the horizontal wells, they means a positive uh, increase in PMP, right? So the, these blue signals around the wells means the impedance increases. So as we know, this is a water injector wells. This is a fluid effect. So this is the water. So that's how the water is moving into the reservoir. And this is very easy to explain, of course, because they're, they're very close. They're, they're just around the, the completions of the injector wells. So I have, it's very easy to do, right? So there is no doubt that these are related to the water that you just inject in the fuel. Okay, and uh, if you look at monitor two, we can see the evolution of the scene. You see, like let's say, for instance, this one, uh, the water is moving a little bit farther, so it's it's increasing this signal related to the water move movement in the field. Uh, but then there are some uh, more difficult to explain signals. So, for instance, these blue ones here, they are close to a completion of two producer wells. So then it's a little bit more hard to explain because this increase in impedance can be uh, the water, maybe this water, there is a water that reaches this well, or maybe this is a, 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 a signal that is related to the depletion. So there is a, a, a the pressure, a pore, the pore pressure is, is decreasing around these completions and then it generates the signal. So we need to explain it. So, and if it's water, let's say if it's water, so why I'm not seeing the, the water, well, it should be coming from this injector well, right? So, but there is a gap here, there's a white, there is nothing here between the producer and the water coming from the injector. So how can I explain that? Okay, so this is everything that a geophysicist needs to explain when the 4D size data, uh, that's, that's all related to the interpretation of 4D size data, right? So we need to explain what they mean, as I said, there are some ones that are very easy to explain because they're obvious. Other ones, they are not that obvious. Uh, we need to explain their shape as well. So why, let's say for instance, so this is a, uh, actually this is a, a sign related to the gas going out of solution, okay? So there is some funny shape you see here, there is a funny shape. So why this, this funny shape is happening? We need to explain that. Is there any geological features that is limiting that is actually drawing the signal, we, we discovered that that's the case here. So this funny shape is coming from some uh, uh, facious distributions, funny distributions that we could not see in the 3D seismic data. Uh, so also another important thing that we need to do is to explain the regions without any 4D signals. Like 
as I said here, so it might be the case that this guy is producing the water that is coming from this injector, but why, why there is nothing here in the middle? Why, why it's black, right? Uh, by the way, I'm going to explain now. This wa water here is not the water coming from this injector. This water is coming, it's coming from a water colony that formed with the base, uh, with the aquifer. There is an aquifer in the base of the reservoir, and then this, uh, this water is not injected water. This uh, water is coming from the aquifer. So that's why there is no connection, okay? It's not that this water is, is moving towards the direct, the, 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 towards the producer. Uh, and we need to evaluate the evolution of our design size along a long time, right? Like here we have monitor one and monitor two, so we need to we use it to understand how how it's it's happening. Uh, okay, this is ah this is another example uh, that uh, it's a picture of this the same the same the same field that I showed before, but this is a vertical it's a vertical section, right? So that's a cross section, a vertical section passing through the reservoir. So the reservoir is here. So that's the top and that's the base. And that's what I will mention. That, um, that for the signal that I showed that was coming from an aquifer, we are seeing this, this for the signal coming here. So we see the signal is much closer to the base than this one that is related to injection. So that's why we can say that this, is, uh, the, the, this water is being produced from the aquifer. It's not coming from the injector. So this type of things we wouldn't be able to explain if we did not have the before the size data. Well, of course, there are some, some things that can, can explain it. If you have silent measurements, probably you, you might be able to, to explain it as well. Uh, so this is another example. So sometimes the for the interpretation is really hard. For this case, this is another field we worked in the past. So this date was really, really noisy. Uh, and it was really hard to explain. So what we usually do, we use a simulation model and then we generate here, this is the water saturation, the pore pressure, gas and, and oil saturation from the simulation model. And we use them to generate the synthetic seismic data and then we compare. And then we, we try to explain things, you know, things, some signals like this one and this one, they are very similar. So we could explain that this was related to, to some gas that came out of a solution so on. But there are some things that sometimes happen that we don't really know. Like here, uh, well, there is no for this signal in the acquired data at all. But then in the synthetic data, we have some signals. So we don't really know which one is wrong. Sometimes we cannot explain. Because here, it might be the case that the, the noise was so high that we could not see this signal. Or the opposite. It might be the case that my simulation model is wrong and it's generate this signal that should not generate. So. Again, it's a complex text for this size interpretation, but it's quite nice because you you really go deep into the dynamics of the reservoir. Okay, so uh, so the, the for this size data as I, I just showed, so it it allows us to to identify the fluid movement, identification of pressure variations due to depletion or injection, identif identification of flow barriers or high permeability uh, zones or channels. Uh, it contributes to the process of reducing uncertainties, uh, in, including the data simulation, uh, reduction of risks, and improve the forecast. Okay, but how? So now I'm going to talk about the, the, the integration with the, the, the simulation models by itself. Okay, so this is a very, very simple example. So we have this very synthetic, synthetic model, right? So a injector and a producer. So let's assume that this is the real model, and that's our initial model. It's a totally homogeneous model, and in reality, there was a channel here that we didn't know when we built the model. So we know that the the history data, so that's the let's say the water production is here, the history, but the model is wrong. It has it's not it doesn't have a good match with the history, and the forecast is also bad. So when we run a, a, a data simulation that we used to call history match. Uh, we, we might find different models, like all of those uh, things that I draw here. So I might have, I might find all of this model as possible explanation. So they can provide me a good uh, match with well data, with the history well data. But all of these models, uh, although they're, they, are, they, are, they have a good match, they might give us wrong forecast. While when I have the 4D size information, in this very simple example, I'm saying the for the seismic data is showing me the path of the water, right? So the water saturation. So it gives me some clues, some some guess 
of where that I have a channel here. I have a, a preferential path where the water is, is flowing. Okay, so this type of formation will uh, allow me to at least to exclude some very wrong models. Okay, it won't give me the true answer. It won't be able. I I'm not be able to define perfectly this channel, but I have some clue that the water is moving toward uh, this direction. Okay. And then uh, with that, uh, usually we have a uh, safer and better uh, forecast. So this is a very simple example just to explain the role of for this size data inside data simulation. Okay. Uh, well, uh, one thing that we always say uh, is that the, the, the for, sorry, this is 4D, not 3D. So the 4D size data uh, is complementary to to well data, right? So the well data is there is a high temporal frequency because we we have the measurement, the oil rates, the pressure rate, the, the pressure values, the the BHP, right? So they are measured uh, with a very high frequency, so every every day, and but they have a low spatial frequency, of course, because we just have these rates where we have the wells. Okay, while the four D seismic data is the opposite. It has a low temporal frequency because we just have uh, some monitors, you know, after years of production. But it, it is a very high spatial uh, frequency data, right? Because we see kind of an image of the whole thing. So they, they complement each other. So both are very important for, for data simulation. Okay, so now uh, talking about data simulation. Uh, how we use it, how we use the data simulate uh, the 4D size data in the data simulation process. So there are two options. First of all, uh, is qualitatively. So qualitatively means, okay, we, look, we do the size interpretation as I was showing to you, and then you identify a feature. Let's say, ah, I could identify a fault, a barrier here. So then you go into the simulation model, and then you draw a barrier, and that's it. Okay, so you improve the model, and, and that's okay. Or you can use it quantitatively, which means you're going to use the information in the data, the 4D size data, into the data simulation process quantitatively. You're going to force the models to honor this data as well. In the same way you honor the wells, you're going to honor the 4D size data. Okay. Um, so in this process, quantitatively, which is the main focus, including our main research focus in the group, is this integration. Uh, it brings a great contribution because, as I said, uh, we have the maps that we can add into the data simulation, and then it's covering the entire reservoir, right? So it's not we just have uh, we don't have just few points around the uh, around the, the the field which are the well data. Okay, so this is an important data to be on in the data simulation. So this is an example of the first case, which is the qualitative integration. So this is a, a paper from the Northern Field. Uh, so that's the, it's a map view of the 4D size data. And uh, when they, they look at it, they, they could explain the signals and they realized that uh, the, this uh, red zone here was an unfloated zone. So there was a, there were there is a, a water injection here that is injecting water. And initially, so this was the water saturation from the simulation model before data simulation. Okay, so there is this injector well, and that's how they were expecting the water to move toward the producer, which is here. So there is the injector, and then the water should move uh, more or less like this until it reaches the this producer. But then when the 4D size of data arrived, they realized that right, indeed the water, it was moving, uh, it was moving around this, there is this huge, there is a big fault here and the water is moving on this, through this path, not exactly this path, okay? So they could, they change the model, so they, they add a barrier here so that now the, mod, the water is moving toward this direction, okay? So this is an example of a qualitative uh, integration and, and, and how they're calibrating the model uh, to honor this type of data in a qualitative manner. You know, we are not doing data simulation. We're just seeing what's happening on the 4D size of data and then we manually change the model, the simulation model. We can just change the transmissibility of the blocks, for instance, on this region. Okay?
Okay, so when you think, uh, yes, this is like, uh, I think you have seen it because this is from Sam. Um, uh, I always use it, so I borrowed for, for him. So that's the data simulation procedure. Just a quick recap, right? So you have the model, so this is gross impermeability uh, reservoir model, and then you have the history data, and then that's the prediction of the simulation, sorry, that's the, the simulation model uh, estimates for the water rate. So it's wrong and we need to calibrate, right? So, so we start the process. So you change the model, uh, run the simulation again, we evaluate how different are these, these two things, and then uh, we take a decision. If they're close together, yes or no. If they're not, we do it everything again, change the model again until we reach this, something like this, okay? Until we have a model that produces the history data uh, in, in according to whatever definition that you, you might use, right? So that's the data simulation. I'm, I'm pretty sure I said to explain it a lot, right? And very well. So now when we have the 4D seismic data, what changed? The only thing that changed is that I, I'm going to have exactly the same procedures, but now the objective function is written in terms of 4D seismic data. So uh, now in this procedure, I'm going to honor the well data but I'm going to honor a, a map, usually it's a map, but a map that is coming from the 4D size data. So this is an example where we have the a simulation model. So that's before, that's the observed, and that's after the, the data simulation uh, in a quantitative form. Okay, so you force your model, your models to provide for uh, these signals, provide a, a measurement of the 4D signals that are close to what you're observing on the measurements, okay? So that's how we, we use it, and that's our research focus in, in UNIC. Um, so I think, uh, I don't have too much time, let me see, I might sk skip some of the slides, okay. Um, yeah, okay, so when we talk about the quantitative integration, so we have a reservoir model and we have the observed data. So when you have the, the simulation model, the dynamic model, it can provide us a pressure and saturation. So that's the output of the simulation model, as you know, okay? And then you have the observed data, which are the size amplitudes. So the, the big issue is that how can I compare these things? You know, how can I compare pressure and saturations with seismic data, with seismic signals, right? So there are some paths to fall, right? So the, one of the things that we can do is, okay, we take the output of, from reservoir simulations, we can run a, a petrolus model, which is a rock phase model, and then generate impedance, for instance. The P impedance, which is, uh, I've just mentioned a lot in the beginning of the, the class. And then we can also run another procedure, which is called seismic modeling, and then we can generate the final seismic uh, data, the synthetic seismic data, which we can which we can compare here. On the other hand, looking at the seismic data, I can also go uh, and run some procedures. I can run analyzed conversion, as I already mentioned, and then I can estimate impedance, right? In a second moment, I, I could also run another inversion and estimate pressure and saturation from this for this signal. This is a little bit more hard to do. But then, now I can compare. I can compare, as we say, apples and apples, right? Not apples and pineapples. So I'm comparing or seismic data or impedance or even pressure and saturation. But I have to pay the price, right? So if I'm going to compute right here, this synthetic seismic amplitudes, I need to pay, to pay the price of all of these modeling procedures, which, especially this one, is time consuming. The same for the inversions. I need to pay the, the price of inversions. Uh, they take time, they add, they, they might be uncertain, and so on. So usually, uh, what we do, we, we, we stay in the middle of the way. We use impedance. So we, we use the simulation models, we run our rock physics models, and we generate impedance. And then we run this elastic inversion, and we generate impedance from this observed seismic data. And then we compare them. So then we are safe, we compare apples and apples. In terms of, uh, of costs, we are more or less in, in the half of the way for both data, so it's more or less, it's worth it. Okay, so that's the very, the most common domain to integrate those data, to, to actually integrate quantitatively. 
Um, so, so the challenge when we talk about data simulation are these, right? So we have different physical properties. So that's what I just mentioned. So we have modeling process or inversion process. So we need to bring the data, the simulation, the reservoir simulation, and the size data to a common domain. We have different scales. So the simulation model, it has a very high vertical resolution and, it, and not very big uh, spatial resolution compared to the size, and the size is the opposite. The vertical resolution of size is around to 10 to 15 meters, and the spatial uh, resolution is around to 12 to 20 meters, right? So the resolution is different. The grids are totally different. So we have a stratigraphic grid, so a distortion grid, like a corner point or something like this, and the regular grid from, from the size we data. So all of these challenges we need to overcome to, to do the integration, right? We need to calibrate this, these rock physics models for, for the specific reservoir we're working. We really need to run some science conversion, which can be costly and, and sometimes, uh, well, it takes time, yeah? And time is money, as I said. So all of these change, uh, that these are, as you can imagine, these are all topics of research to, to improve uh, the procedure of data integration. Um, okay, I think I, I, I'm going to jump this example uh, because I would like to, to go to the, okay, to the final ones. Uh, let's see. Okay. Uh, I'll, I'll pass more quickly on this one. So uh, this, is a, this paper is from BP. Uh, if you're interested, I, I have the reference in the end, so the British uh, Petroleum. Uh, and they are discussing the issue, uh, the importance of for this size of data and data simulation process, right? So they draw here two sets. So we have the sets of a set of models that match well data and a set of models that match only size of data. So here, the intersection between the two sets are the models that uh, are good for well and size of data. So what they show in this work, uh, I see in this plot, I think it's quite interesting. So they do, they they, they did an analysis of. Uh, so first of all, they do they do they did a data uh, assimilation using history data up to, to to the year of 2000, and then they they studied the behavior of the forecast of these models. So how good was the forecast for these models? Okay, for for up from 2000 up to 2004. Okay, so they were uh, evaluating the quality of forecast against the quality of, of the, the calibration, I mean, the, the history matching of these models. So that's the history matching quality, so that's the, the X axis, okay? And this is the forecast, the prediction match quality. So uh, the models that are here in this white ellipsis, uh, they have what we would expect, right? So if we have a good history matching. Mean, if we get, if the data simulation provides me models that honor the well data, it gives me a good, uh, uh, a good prediction. Okay, so this is more or less what we would expect. However, there were some models that have a very good, I mean, a low, a good uh, history matching quality here, but they give us, uh, they gave bad forecast. Also, very wrong, very poor forecast. So these are the dangerous models for the decision make uh, taker, right? So that's the dangerous models. And and then uh, they evaluate the models that are in the intersection here. So this here were, they were talking about just well match. When they add the 4D size data, and when they pick just uh, well, so the models that match the 4D size data are this colored one. And the ones that are in the intersection are these one here. So what they claim in this paper is that uh, they have safer, they believe that they have safer production forecast because when you use the 4D seismic data to match your simulation models in a data simulation procedure, you exclude those dangerous models. So you exclude those models that give us a bad uh, forecast, bad future predictions, right? So that's what this is written here. So now I'm going to the last part, uh, which are the, the very, I think, the nicest uh, part of the presentation, the talk. I hope you're still awake there, because I, I, do, I do think these are the, the most exciting ones. So this is the marine field, one of the papers from Petrobras, uh, where they, it's a, it's, a, it's a field where I think it was the first one, if I'm not wrong, in Brazil, to have a 40 size position, okay? So, 
This is in, in campus base. Uh, it is it's a very mature field. It was covered in 85. It's a sandstone, a turbidite with excellent rock characteristics. So uh, they have a relative families favorable to water injection. Uh, and when before they acquired, they, they decide to invest in for this seismic data because they have a, a, a big uncertainty uncertainty related to the geological model. Uh, and how the, the, the permeability was distributed along the field. Okay, in the occurrence of shears, okay. So the main objective for the seismic data was car reservoir characterization and, and monitoring. Okay, so they had, uh, I don't know, maybe, I don't know if they had more because this paper is from 20, 20, 2007, but they have three seismic surveys, okay, 86, 96, and 2005. All right, so this is uh, one of the, the first things that they, they claim of this paper. So that was actually the most important uh, contribution to for this seismic data because they could uh, identify this anisotropy on the on the field so they could perform a much better uh, geological model uh, of, of of the field so this is uh, this map on the left are the 4d size data okay so that's a map from the 4d size data and then on the right it's a geological model uh, that's the permeability of the, the geological model that was uh, updated after they saw the size data so uh, this light blues means the water path Right, so they saw that there was a, um, a direction, a preferential direction uh, that the water was moving. So they could find this anisotropy on the depositional system. And that's what they did. They, uh, that's, and then they used this information to update the geological model. Uh, so, so this is, I think it, this is, is quite, uh, it's quite interesting uh, because usually people do it, but they don't show it. And in this paper, they show it. So I think it's very fair. So on the original, uh, on the original, on the left side, they, they are showing here the original uh, absolute horizontal permeability map. So that's the permeability, and that's the permeability map they have after they run. Uh, on that moment, uh, it was a history matching. They have a single model, and they were doing history matching, uh, uh, history matching procedure. Okay, so the model looked like this. So that's what they call geological monster because uh, the engineer has to add some features in the models, those rectangles, those uh, funny shapes, with funny shapes that we know that these are not uh, geological uh, features. I mean, we know that this is wrong, okay? But they have to do it to, to, to be able to do uh, the history matching. So this was a practice that was very common. Nowadays it's changing quite a lot and this is it's, it's, it's being avoided, but it was very it was very common. And sometimes it's still common nowadays, okay? So after they, they, they look at the, the 4D size data, uh, as I said in the previous slides, they could identify this uh, anisotropy of the field. So they add this anisotropy this, uh, of the field in the geological model. And then, and this on the on the right side is the same map after they did the history match. So now the, the reservoir engineers they didn't not they didn't need anymore this uh, to, to include this uh, this uh, funny stuff in the models. Now they could have a, a, a simulation mod that was matching the the well data. Uh, that and, and has and that and that had a much more uh, geological uh, the, the features looks much more geological than than the previous one. Okay. Uh, another example of this uh, of this model here is that they identify uh, some uh, partially sealing faults, uh, and this well was uh, I think P one yeah P one and PH one these two wells they were uh, hard to adjust so that's. The water cuts the history data, and this was the the simulation model uh, curve. So you see, it's very it's very different. I mean, it was bad, and it, and they mentioned it was hard to do the history matching of this. Well, and the same for this one. So that's the water cut. the The history data is in, in the blue, and this is the simulation model before the history matching. And after they they changed the transmissibility of the faults, they saw here in the four D seismic data. So they, they were able to have this <clears throat> yellow model here that's much, much better. Uh, another interesting thing is uh, uh, repositioning of a well. Uh, there was an infield drilling. 
So the infield drilling uh, was they, they were they had already defined the position of the well, and the position of the well was this one. Uh, and after they saw, so this the image on, on behind it is the 4D size of data. So where we see light blue means a place where we have a high amount of water. So they decide they decide to move the well, the infield drilling from this position to this one. Uh, because they are avoiding, of course, the, the, the water flooded zone. Uh, another, uh, this is a very classical example <clears throat> of for the seismic data. So this is the simulation model. So that's the water saturation from the simulation model they have. The simulation model before any uh, history matching, before using the for the seismic data, right? So <clears throat> they knew that this well P3 was producing water. And the simulation model was uh, showing that this water was coming from injector one, okay, from here. But then uh, when they, they look at the for the seismic data, which is this one on the right side, again, the light blues means the, where we see the waters, uh, the waterfront, right? So they realized that actually the water that it was being produced by P3 was coming from I3, from this injector, not that one. You see, we can see more or less how the water uh, was uh, reaching this well. Much, uh, so it's much pro most probable that the water's coming from here than from there, okay? So if you do not have tracers, uh, this is a, this type of formation would be impossible to, to guess, right? Without the 4D seismic data, if you do not have traces, as I said. Um, Okay, so then uh, the major, they, they mentioned the paper, the work that the, the major contribution of for the size data was to improve the simulation model and of course reduce the risks. Uh, and they generate a totally new model after they received the data, after the interpretation of for the size data. And this model uh, allowed a better history matching without the need of major chains, indicating greater reliability in the forecast. So I think this is a uh, this paper I like to bring in the class because um, it, it shows several examples from this real field and it's, uh, it's something uh, easy to follow because some some of the papers they are very too complex and too detailed but this is more like a uh, applications of for this so I think it, it's it's a nice nice thing to do. Uh, the last example that I, I'll, I'll show today uh, is this one so that's Ecofisk it's a carbonate reservoir. So this is operated by Conoco Phillips uh, in the North Sea. Okay, so also it's a very mature field. So it started producing in the 70s. I don't, to be honest, I don't know if it's still produced. I'm not sure. But this is, is this carbonate is different from our carbonate from the Brussels. This is a chalk, and and this field suffers a lot from um, sub, subsidence. I sorry, I don't know how to say this in English. Uh, but they, they have a very strong effect on, on, of compaction in the field. So there is this very classical uh, picture of the platform. So uh, so this is, it was in the beginning of the production. So I don't really know the date, but after some years of production, uh, they, they, we can see that the platform was, uh, was uh, going down here for some meters. Okay, so they have this... Uh, very serious problem with sub subsidence. Um, they say even here, so three meters, uh, three meters in thirty years. So it's it's really long, okay. Uh, and and they they realize well, so they they start a four D campaign, campaign. Uh, so they start uh, with in the nineties. Uh, so and they could see with the first monitor that they could see uh, the four D signals were revealing the compaction effects in the field. So after that, they, they decided to invest even more and they acquired more surveys. And in 2008, they installed a permanent uh, monitoring system. So here, from these decisions, we can see that the, the 4D size data was really adding value to the field uh, management, right? Uh, so they mentioned here that uh, this, field, this field is very challenging. Uh, to operate, right? So, so they say that they, they to conduct a successful drilling campaign they, in this mature chalk uh, is really challenging, as as you know, because of all of these problems of compaction. And 
and they say that the, the for the size of data can help it, it quite a lot okay uh, okay so this paper in particular told to at all they describe the workflow they use and this is an example of quantitative size uh, data simulation uh, and is an example that I give it for you uh, to see. So it's a very it's a very complex uh, procedure they are doing because they integrate the forty size uh, in the data simulation, but also in the geological modeling. So that's the, the fracture networks, and they use the forty size information uh, to draw. Uh, also to draw the fracture. So they could see some some features indicating the fractures and then they say, okay, they, they give some levels of certainty. So when they're more certain about these, uh, the fractures, so they were using it as like a, a higher data to, to generate the geological models, okay? Uh, so uh, here's some example of the application. So that's the map of, of the for this size data. So, this hole in the middle, uh, it's happening because of the, one of the things that I mentioned in the beginning. So the challenge to, to, to acquire the 4D size data, especially the first ones before the, the even after with the PRM, uh, is that we have a lot of uh, production facilities that are already installed in the field. So they could not uh, pass the both into, through this region. So that's why we have a role, a whole in this, uh, in this, uh, for this seismic data, there, are, there is no signal in the, in the middle because of the platforms and all the installations that are there. Already. Uh, but anyway, uh, they use these, uh, these informations uh, quite a lot to, to identify the positions where these uh, compactions were happening. Because uh, well, they mentioned that the, the reservoir compactions happen uh, due to two, two uh, mechanisms. So the, the pressure reduction due to depletion. So depletion. So we, we have a, a pressure decrease and then the reservoir compacts. So it will happen around, especially around the producers. And also uh, the shock water weakening due to injection. So for all the problem for the, for, to guarantee the well integrity for this field is really, really challenging, okay? Uh, and then here I'm just saying that, uh, well, the time shifts, uh, it's, a, it's a property that we start from the, the 4D seismic data. Uh, they review uh, these regions where it's happening a, 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 a compaction. So that's what we're saying here. So these regions uh, in, in, in pink, in magenta here, are showing the compaction of the reservoir. And they, and they said that this uh, makes sense because it was in agreement with a, a PLT measurements that they did, it's a production one and two. Uh, so, so this uh, compaction that the 4D signals are showing are in agreement with what's happening in the field. Um, okay, so so this is the workflow they 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 use it in the field the, in the history matching. So as I said, it's a very it's a very complete workflow. They prepare the the, the geological model. They also use the 4D size to generate the geological model. They simulate the flow, the fluid flow, and the rock physics models. For the data simulation with for the size data they generate as i said they generate a synthetic for the size response from the fluid and rock phase forecast and then uh, this is uh, probably uh Salu has already mentioned it about with with you which is the big loop so instead of updating the dynamic model in this case they update the geological model so they when they see if the data is not matching they go back to the geological model and change the geological model so that they can match the actual production and injection profiles as well as the 4D size response. Okay, so this is a this uh, work here. It's a, it's a very uh, complete and, and and actually complex case. Okay, so there are some more images, but I think I'm going to 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 skip this one. Okay, uh, well, I think uh, I think it's a red eleven. Uh, I'm going to stop here. Uh, we also have in the group, uh, in the group we have these studies that's related to the value of information. Uh, so this was a, a PhD thesis that was uh, defended some years ago, and we're still working on that. So it's a it's a that thing that is uh, we try to estimate the value of of information, okay, to see if it's worth or not acquiring for the seismic data. Um, so, uh, so it's I don't know if you, if you're still there. Uh, 
then it's, I don't know if you're there, but do you think it's worth going through uh, this VOE? Right? Or yeah. I can stop here because I don't know if they are awake still. <laughs> Uh, I don't know. If, maybe you can stop the class formally, and then just you can give this information for them just informally after that, because we're planning to finish at 11. But I think it's an interesting, and I, I don't think maybe I have to ask them because I, I I didn't see Susanna talking about this at the end of her class. Danielle, okay. do you remember if Susanna have already talked about this? No, no, uh, I think she didn't talk about this. Okay, I can I can go quickly through that, especially because, well, this is not my main specialty. Then you can help us, by the way, <laughs> if, you, okay. if you can. But I can go uh, quickly just for them to have an idea of what we are doing in terms of well, okay. information, yeah, so yeah, as... Just go okay. quickly and then if they have additional questions, I can talk to them in, in their other classes. Okay, all right. <laughs> Uh, so, the value of information uh, for especially for the 4D seismic data, right? So we are trying to estimate the value of of acquiring a 4D seismic data in a project, and it depends on some some things, right? So it depends, of course, on the reservoir uncertainties we need to take into account, uh, the impact on field management, of course, uh, uh, the the 4D seismic, as I already said, it will bring some values just if it can change uh, decisions, right? Uh, also, it depends on the date of, of acquisition. All of this depends on when you're going to acquire this data uh, and also other source of data. Okay, so this, this is like uh, I picked from Carla, which was a uh, one of our research from the group, okay? So uh, then we have some definitions here. So the expected value of formation, so this is a single value, right? But in, in UNICIN, actually, uh, they propose that, uh, Carlos, the Professor Dins, they propose a, a methodology that's called chance of success, so COS. So this, it shows us actually not a single value, let's say, oh, that's the value for the size data, but a range of possibilities. So we see a range of possibilities taken into account, including the reservoir in certain instance, and then, uh, not only with one certainty, you can also add all the uncertainties, like economical uncertainties. And then uh, you see uh, the range of possibilities, and then you see, okay, if it is worthy or not acquiring this information, right? So uh, this COS methodology proposed by uh, by Carla, uh, it, it, it was uh, based on the 12 steps methodology that was proposed by Professor Dennis, right? So it takes into consideration uncertainty analysis, data simulation, uh, representative models and, and the future decisions, right? So basically all the, those 12 steps. So there are some possibilities to, to develop this, uh, this uh, methodology. Uh, so in, in this presentation, I'm going to show what she did first, which is uh, to estimate the maximum value of a perfect information. So based on production optimization and of models. So what you're saying here, we're saying, okay, let's assume that the, the in this case the for this uh, the information is for the size of data right so let's assume that the for the size of data has no issues i mean it can uh, actually uh, let's say uh, reveal how the water saturate how the water moved inside the reservoir without any problems of resolution noise and so on and then we see the value of it so this is a start and then you can uh, we can we could evolve to more sophisticated methodology that's something that is going on in the group uh, maybe Dennis can talk a little bit more about it after. And then we can go to imperfect information, alternative information, so on. So I'll, I'll keep this, this few slides with this case here, okay? Uh, so that's the workflow she was uh, performing. So she starts, and the first thing, she runs an uncertainty analysis and risk analysis. So she identifies and quantifies uncertainties. She generates all the scenarios and definition and, the, and, and evaluate the risk level of the project. Right. So, and then the first, the second step of, of Carla's uh, methodology is uh, to define the date of acquisition because uh, we need to, if we want to, uh, to quantify the value of information, uh, a very important uh, thing to, to think is when this information is going to arrive. Right. So, for the for the seismic data specifically, what she did was to evaluate how was uh, how was the the dynamic change in the reservoir, 
Okay, so how, how it was in terms of fluid movement. So this was the main goal here. Uh, so she did an analysis uh, on the production data. Uh, so she picked the time so, in, in, so that uh, the, if you acquire the data, you would have enough time to improve the, the, the decision making, the, the reservoir management. Uh, you could uh, reduce reservoir uncertainty. Of course, the, the, I mean the data would have some value to to improve the models, and and time for for the water break too. Uh, so that's something uh, specific for this for this case because uh, this is a water flow example. And of course, we want to acquire the for this size data before the water reaches all the producer wells, right? So because if if the water reaches right the wells. Uh, you know, it's there, it's there, right? So we, you didn't avoid it, and so so the information lose value. So, uh, so she did this uh, complete analysis of when it will be a good time for this uh, for this case she was studying. After that, uh, she select the representative models uh, because she she needs to, to estimate the impact of having this information on considering the reservoir uncertainty, right? So we have hundreds of scenarios. So. As it is expensive to optimize randoms of, of, of models, of, uh, we use the representative models. I'm sure uh, you had a class about that already. Uh, so she picked some representative models uh, to represent the variability of the attributes and the objective function. Okay. So this was the first approximation for the, the estimation of the chance of success. And then she did the strategy optimization for all the representative models uh, she selected. Right. Uh, considering that she had the data, so the data uh, at this in this uh, first round of, of optimizations, and in the second one, she considering that she didn't have the data, and then she compared the two, right? Uh, so then she compared the e, the e IER of the two cases, right? And finally, she built this uh, curve here that she called probably this curve. Uh, where she shows the probability, so that's a cumulative course, and then uh, she's showing on the x, y, the increase in expected revenue, so that's the, the variation in, in, in NPV, right? And then in red, she's plotting here the cost of, of, of for the, the approximated cost of for the seismic data, right? So in this case, uh, we could see that she had a probability of almost 50% of having a, a, a revenue uh, if uh, you acquire the seismic data, okay? So that's a very general view of how the methodology works. I think I have, oh, yes, 44%, must be, sorry. Uh, I have another example that they, they apply the same procedure for Unicine 1. Uh, it was a work developed by Anna. So it's the same idea. So the idea was to estimate the probability of a size acquisition being an economic success. Okay, so based on the models we have. And then she run the same procedure. So she run the certainty and uh, analysis, and then she select the representative models. Uh, she did the production optimization based on these models, and she ended up with this uh, with this curve here, the same, the very the same one. And for the only thing case. Missing one, uh, this value was uh, 75. So we have 75% uh, percent, uh, of change of changes of of having a, 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 a of succeed in the for this size acquisition for this project here. Okay. Uh, yes. So I think that's all. It was very resumed. I don't know if Dennis would like to complement or to correct something that I, I said. Um, but yes. So that's that's what I, I had here. No, I think it's okay. Just uh, just an idea of how the methodology works. So we can uh, give more detail in other classes if they have mm -hmm. about it. Okay. Okay. Great. I'll then stop recording here.